Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to start out thanking the elders for this opportunity to uh, stand in front of you and present uh, words from the Gospels. It's not uh, my everyday job, but I enjoy doing it. Sometimes I'm more stressed out doing this than uh, being out there on the road, so um, bear with me. I'm going to read the uh, scripture reading again, starting in uh, Luke 9, starting in verse 10. Luke 9, starting in verse 10. On the return, the apostles told him all what they had done. And he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him. And he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. They said, We have no more than five loaves and two fishes, unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about five thousand men. And he said to his disciples, Have them sit down in groups of about fifty each. And they did so. And had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And and what was left over was picked up, twelve baskets of broken pieces. Growing up, I used to read this story a lot, um, being a member of the church and growing up in the church. I always wondered, why did he feed them? It was just always a question to me of why. I understood how I could read the story and see all the details, but why? And that's something that I've, uh, when we read through this back in the Bible study, when we went over this, this was something I thought about. And I came up with six simple things that I believe is why. And these are lessons that we need to apply to ourselves as Christians from this, this part. The first thing I noticed when I read through this this section of verses is that the apostles were trying to turn people away from Christ. In verse 12, we see that he said to send them away so they can get their own food. Jesus was ministering to these people and to the crowd's physical health by healing people and their spiritual needs by preaching. And the apostles were focused on that physical needs while Jesus was on the spiritual. Christ had just explained spiritual food to, these, uh, to the apostles in Matthew 5 and verse 6 in the Beatitudes. Matthew 5 and verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So we know that the apostles should have been focused on the spiritual, but they weren't. They were focused on this, uh, the physical needs And um, we know that they had just returned from teaching those about the gospel in in the first part of this chapter, verses 1 through 6. Luke 9, 1 through 6. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust of your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. The apostles had just got done teaching people. But yet here, at the end of this, in the, later in this chapter, they're sending people away and not focusing on that spiritual need. And we can be that way also. We can get short-sighted and think only about the physical, and we also need to be focusing on the spiritual. So in our lives, are we focusing on the physical, or should we be spending it on the, phys- on the spiritual? Secondly, something else I noticed is that Jesus challenged the apostles to feed this group. Jesus, having just explained feeding the soul, told the group to feed the crowds. But they were so confused about the spiritual and the physical, the apostles couldn't follow along. The apostles had just watched Jesus heal these people of illnesses, but they didn't think that five loaves and two fishes were enough. Do we feel that this is a lack of faith on the apostles' part and not noticing the difference? For me, I feel like this is a teaching opportunity. That the apostles, just like the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4, 
Jesus spoke to the thirst quenching water and the spiritual food, but the apostles were focused on the physical and doubted Jesus' ability. Let's go over to John 4 and read about the Samaritan woman. John 4, beginning at the first verse. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had come to pass, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sire, near the field that Jacob had given to his sons Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, for it was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no de dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So we see here a lot the same between asking the apostles to feed them, he's speaking of the spiritual, and here he's speaking of the spiritual water also. And this is something that uh, we can struggle with also. Do we doubt Christ's abilities in our lives? And do we know that Jesus will provide for us physically so that we should be more focused on the physical, or on the spiritual? In Luke 12, 29 and verse 31, Luke 12, 29 through 31, we know that uh, we should not be worried about the, the physical life. Luke 12, verse 29. And do not seek what you are to eat or what you are to drink, nor be worried. For, for all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. We should not be focused on the physical things in life, but the spiritual, because God will provide for us. And this is something that the apostles struggled with here. Next, I noticed that the apostles were told to organize and serve the gathering. First, like kind of an aside, can you imagine trying to seat more than 5,000 people and put them in groups of 50? I only have so many fingers and toes. I feel like that would be a hard thing to do to try to keep all those people organized. It'd be like herding cats. So <clears throat> I just feel like that would be a huge thing to do. But just like Christ told the apostles to organize these people and to serve them, we also are told to serve people. When he told them to serve them, he had them organized, and we need to be able to serve others. Galatians 5 and verse 13. In Galatians 5 and verse 13, Paul here says, uh, Galatians 5. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbors as yourself. But if you bite and devour another, watch out that you are not consumed by another one. And also if we look in Galatians 6, verse 6. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, one will also reap. For what the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap, for if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially those who are of the household of faith. As Christians, we are told to serve others, and Paul warns that God knows what we are doing. Are we doing good to other people? Not only that, are we especially doing good to those of the household of faith? Fourth, I noticed that Christ has compassion on everyone, regardless of being tired. 
if we look at the Mark account of feeding the 5,000, Mark chapter 6 and verse 30. And the apostles returned and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves for a desolate area and rest a while. If we skip down to verse 34. And when they went ashore, he saw a great cow, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. So we see Christ telling the apostles after their ministry that they need to pull apart and take a, take a time out, get a rest in. But when Jesus sees the multitudes, he has compassion. This is a, a, an example for everybody. We're told to be imitators in uh, 1 Corinthians 11. So... Um, in verse 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So just like Paul imitated Christ, we also are supposed to imitate Christ. And this is that example of us showing compassion on other people. We should love those around us, especially Christians. We should always be wanting to help people out if we can. 1 John 3, in, uh, 1 John 3 starting in verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderers have has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, that we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if, anyone has the world, if, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth." Just like Christ was willing to sacrifice of himself when he was tired, we should also be willing to help those around us. We need to show compassion like Christ did, and we need to be helping those Christians around us. Christ was also gracious to everyone. Christ performed a miracle to feed these people. He was also healing the sick. Christ was teaching and expected the apostles to continue teaching. Christ is gracious to us so also by sacrificing himself. Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace through, faith, uh, through God. Start that over. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have obtained access by faith into his grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that the sufferings produce endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Do we recognize the gift from God? And do we appreciate it? How are we living our lives? Is it in service to God? And the last thing that I notice is that there's always those searching for salvation. In the original text, in verse 11, we see that they were seeking him out. When the crowd learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. People were looking for Christ, and they received instructions about the kingdom of God. The apostles had just returned from preaching, a preaching trip. We also expected to teach others, Mark 16, 15, and 16. There are people in this world that are looking for Jesus and salvation, Luke 10, uh, 2 and 3. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the of the harvest and to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. We need to be able to teach those in this world. Are we studying our Bibles to teach others? Are we being examples and shining lights? 
Are we putting Christ on by becoming Christians? To become a Christian is simple. You need to hear the word. We need to believe it. Repent of our sins and confess Christ and be baptized. If there are any of those here wishing to become a Christian or need a prayer from the congregation, please come forward as we stand and sing.